it's because I've got two screens going. Um, so yeah, I am Joe. I'm, uh, like say, a third year PhD student. Uh, specifically, my thesis is based on uh, how to use artificial intelligence to find dark matter at the uh, Large Hadron Collider at CERN. Um, we're not going to be doing anything uh, too <laughs> difficult today like that, uh, but we will be having a look at some of the uh, algorithms that we would uh, possibly use uh, when we do that sort of thing. Uh, and specifically today, we're going to be having a look at uh, an astronomical uh, example. Uh, so before we start, I'm going to give a few useful links, uh, but it should also be said that if you do have any questions throughout, uh, there are going to be opportunities for you to ask questions. Um, you can uh, code along as well, and I will give you sort of like some instruction on how to do that uh, as part of the tutorial. Um, but if you don't want to code along and you would just prefer to listen and maybe just absorb a bit more of the information, that is totally fine as well. There will be code snippets uh, coming up, uh, but you will see all that in due time. Uh, so some useful links, first of all, uh, we're going to be having a look at an astronomical uh, version of artificial intelligence um, for various reasons that I'll get onto. But there, uh, I wouldn't be a proper particle physicist if I didn't put in a particle physics example for this. Um, so if you go to this link uh, that you can see here, and I will uh, try and make this uh, presentation available somehow um, to people so they can uh, look over it afterwards. Um, you'll be able to have a look at the kind of algorithms that we use in particle physics. So this specifically is a convolutional neural network, uh, which we won't touch on today um, too much, but we will have a look at neural networks later on. This whole uh, presentation is based around a Kaggle page. Uh, if you are starting out uh, with AI or anything really when it comes to uh, learning how to program, or even if you are advanced and you want to kind of kick up your game a little bit, uh, going to Kaggle is a really good resource. Uh, it's a website where you can upload your own notebooks, where you have done your own uh, data analysis. Other people will upload their, their own notebooks, and they will also upload the data locally so that you can download that and uh, follow along with them. Um, so this uh, was based on some data that uh, someone called Shivam uploaded. Um, and you can find the link to that there. There is also a GitHub repository uh, with all the code from these tutorials, plus a few little extra bits and pieces uh, that we're not going to be able to cover today. Uh, so I did uh, this data with more than the three um, models that we're going to be doing using, using today. So if you're interested in things like uh, random forests or support vector machines, uh, other things that we won't be uh, so much uh, touching on today, then that is where you should go. Uh, there is also some data there that you can download uh, if you wish to and have a play around with, um, and a few different ways of doing some of the algorithms that we're going to be looking at today. Uh, if you don't know, uh, GitHub is a fantastic resource for storing code and storing versioning. So you can do versioning controls. So say if you write uh, some boilerplate stuff, some sort of like background code that should uh, do a uh, general sort of algorithm, um, and then you change that, you can um, upload both of those to GitHub and it will keep a record of those changes. It's very, very good. Um, everyone should use it more often. Uh, DataCamp is a really good resource. They don't pay me. I wish they did sponsor me, but they don't pay me. Um, but I will be uh, an evangelist for them uh, <laughs> until I die, I think. Uh, they do some great free courses, uh, but you can also then sign up uh, to, to pay for a year long membership and, and sort of keep that going. Um, some of this information in the presentation comes from the introduction to deep learning with Keras uh, that they offer. And I'll talk a bit more about Keras later on. Some other useful links, if you want something uh, that is slightly easier on your wallet, um, will be uh, Towards Data Science, which is a fantastic resource for theory. Um, and Coursera and Elite Data Science both do their own machine learning courses for free. Um, and there's, there's premium versions of that as well. Uh, at the bottom there, that is my work email address. If you have any questions that we don't manage to cover, or if you just have any questions in general about um, AI and the intersection between AI and science, um, then please do uh, email me and I will try and get back to you. Uh, it's always good when I can procrastinate from completing my thesis. That's great. Okay, so before we start talking about any kind of algorithm, the most important thing that you need to do is understand the data. 80% of your time as a data scientist 
is trying uh, to understand and manipulate your data, cleaning your data uh, and doing that sort of thing. Um, I have taught entire courses, well, entire tutorials uh, on just how to clean data it is that important. Um, the data that we're going to be using today is, like I said, uh, investigating pulsars. So uh, I'm not assuming that everybody here is a physicist, um, because otherwise it'd be an incredibly boring chat, of course. Um, so they uh, pulsars are highly magnetized neutron stars. Neutron stars uh, are formed when a star, a huge star, usually about eight times the size of our own, uh, goes into a supernova stage collapses down, the core gets very, very, very dense. It's actually the densest object in the universe, aside from black holes. Um, a teaspoon of neutron star, for example, uh, will weigh as much as Mount Everest does. So they are incredibly dense. Uh, pulsars are the version that emit radiation from their magnetic poles. So much the same way that Earth has a north and south pole, so do uh, pulsars. And that radiation uh, can either be very, very focused, very collimated, or it can be very dispersed. Um, and those metrics are some of the things that we're going to explore today with the uh, columns in this data frame below. So the picture on the, the right hand side is, um, as you can probably guess, an artist impression of what a pulsar might look like. Um, but the uh, table below is a data frame. Uh, it's a relational database, which is what we create using um, Python libraries like pandas. And it has eight columns, which are our features. So they're the interesting things. Uh, they contain metrics for measuring pulsars like kurtosis, which is sort of uh, um, how it uh, oscillates around its uh, axis. Uh, dispersion of radiation, so how tightly packed that radiation is coming out of the um, magnetic poles, uh, among other things. So, you know, standard deviation of, of, uh, of orbit and, and things like this. Crucially, there is also a target class, which is made up of zeros and ones, depending on whether we have, uh, we don't have a pulsar, which is a zero, and we do have a pulsar. So the algorithms that we're going to be looking at today are supervised algorithms. Um, however, the caveat there is that we do have the ability to manipulate some of them into unsupervised. Now, supervised and unsupervised are the two kinds of artificial intelligence. Uh, supervised will have a target class. So basically you're telling the algorithm, hey, this is a pulsar, this is not a pulsar. And so the algorithm learns that when we have a row with a one at the end of it, all the values in that row will contribute to uh, a pulsar. And all the values in the row that, that have a zero at the end of it in, in the target class uh, will contribute to not being a pulsar, and so it can sort of learn on those. Uh, unsupervised algorithms, you don't necessarily have that target class. So if you've ever gone on Netflix and it's recommended something uh, that you've enjoyed, uh, that's because it uses an unsupervised uh, machine learning algorithm, which will take your data and it will then uh, sort of go through that, chew through that, and it will produce a an idea of what you might like. Uh, so I used to work for a company, well, I did a uh, placement for a company called Receipt Bank, uh, where I took some data from um, accounts and I was able to create a, uh, an unsupervised algorithm that then sort of uh, segmented the user base into different kinds of users so that you can market to them differently because they might want different things. So today, what are we doing? Well, we're going to be creating three different machine learning algorithms uh, to identify pulsars from our data. Uh, we're going to understand how to use very specific Python modules to do this. And we're going to get an idea of when to use and when not to use each algorithm. Uh, this is, I would love to say that there is a rigorous way of figuring out how to do this, some kind of mathematically uh, rigorous way of doing it. But an awful lot of the time, this is just tweaking of uh, some parameters. The relevant libraries will be uh, sklearn and scipy. Those will be our sort of scientific Python libraries uh, that do kind of like the background um, uh, data science. Pandas handles uh, getting our data out of uh, CSV files. And um, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, matplotlib will do our visualizations when we're making graphs. Uh, NumPy is the bread and butter, the backbone of all numerical Python. It is a fantastic library, consistently updated, cannot 
express to you enough how good NumPy is. Uh, Keras and TensorFlow work often in tandem. So TensorFlow is the back end to Keras's front end. Uh, so you can think of it if you have a website, everything that you can click on with a mouse would be Keras. Uh, and everything that actually does all the meat of the analysis would be TensorFlow. That's not to say that TensorFlow is, sorry, that Keras is kind of like my first machine learning algorithm kind of thing. I still use Keras. Uh, it's just a much easier way of doing uh, AI. You can code primarily in TensorFlow if you wish, um, but we're going to be using Keras uh, mostly today. So let's have a look at the first model then. Uh, we'll be going to start with uh, one of the simpler cases. So this is logistic regression. Um, now, before someone uh, sort of raises an eyebrow and says, shouldn't that be a logistic? I say logistic because it's based on logarithms and uh, log likelihoods and things like that. Uh, if you want to call it a, a, a logarithm, you're more than welcome to do so. Uh, but regardless of how you pronounce it, uh, it usually is used to model uh, binary variables, so zeros or ones. The caveat here is that you can actually use it to model uh, non-binary variables, um, but the algorithm looks slightly different and isn't going to be particularly useful for us today when we have target classes that have zeros or ones. Uh, now, regression uh, is the kind of algorithm that allows us to get just a value at the end. Uh, there is another kind of algorithm called a classification algorithm, which uh, instead sorts into different categories. So for instance, if we are trying to figure out uh, whether it's uh, Helen in her video chat or a cat walking across the screen, uh, we might use a classification algorithm. Uh, if we're trying to figure out how many cats there is, there are in Helen's screen, we might be doing a regression algorithm, right? Uh, and that's just sort of like the difference between the two. Uh, we call it a, log a logistic model because it uses logarithms. Uh, an example of a function that uses logarithms uh, or an example of a logistic logarithm, a uh, logistic function, sorry, uh, would be a sigmoid. Uh, so a sigmoid creates a kind of S-shaped graph. You can see that uh, just down below there uh, on the right-hand side. Uh, and that follows this functional form as one over one plus e to the minus x, where x is our input data. So the way this really works is it will create a, uh, a bunch of sort of log probabilities and it will then uh, fit uh, this function using a fair number of independent variables um, uh, to uh, the data that we have. It then has to do uh, this uh, optimization. It then has to, to make sure that it's actually doing well. Uh, and it does that using something called gradient descent. Stochastic gradient descent, or SGD, is the, I'm trying to make sure that I'm getting this right, until recently, and I think we are talking sort of 2017, 2018, uh, stochastic gradient descent was really the only method that uh, we used for optimization. Um, to explain it, I'm actually going to go to the backup slide I've got here. Uh, so. Gradient descent it works by having some function f of x, um, and that will be uh, differentiable, so you can able to differentiate it around some point theta. Okay, and we call that in the in the uh, the equation down below that would be theta um, i. Now that function will decrease fastest if it goes in the direction of negative gradient. You can imagine it like this. Um, hopefully you can see my mouse there. Uh, you can imagine it like these sort of concentric rings here. So we want to get to this minimum value. And so we're going to go down step by step by step by step by step. Uh, and we do this stepwise process uh, in accordance with this uh, equation here. Uh, we have this as our uh, gradient um, of our function theta i, and this is our new point. Now this gamma here is some real positive number and it controls how strongly we give uh, sort of credence uh, to this gradient descent. Now, if we have a large value of gamma, then we are likely to approach a local minimum in our function. So this sort of minimum value, which is great. That's what we want, that's optimized. Uh, likely to approach this sort of minimum value quite quickly but it may be not a particularly good minimum. It may be that there is a better one that we could find if we had a slightly lower value of gamma. But if we lower that value of gamma, 
um, it are gonna it's gonna take a lot longer to get there. Um, and we do run into a few other problems like overfitting, which I'll explain in a second. Okay, so an issue with uh, logistic regression is that extreme cases, so extremely low values and extremely high values uh, are presumed to be progressively rarer and rarer and rarer at a specific rate, uh, which isn't very good if you don't have much data. Uh, if you have a lot of data, then rare cases aren't really gonna add much to your analysis, right? Uh, because they're rare. But if you have say 10 data points, 100 data points, uh, that means that you could have between sort of, you know, maybe 10, 15 rare cases, and those will actually be, you know, 10%, 15% of your total data, which is a problem. And it will have a hard time trying to fit that. And you can see that from that sort of logistic regression there, it's missing quite a few of those points. Uh, on the left, you'll also see linear regression. I thought I'd add this just in case people have heard of it and sort of wondering why I'm not talking about it. Um, the reason I'm not talking about it is, as you can see, it's not that good. Uh, certainly not for this kind of data. Um, and also logistic regression is, uh, so a, a single logistic regression model is like the, um, the simplest form for something like a neural network. So and we'll, we'll uh, uh, discuss those sort of like how logistic regression feeds into that in a sec. Um, okay, so <clears throat> uh, this is the part where you are more than welcome to uh, follow along with your own uh, Jupyter notebook if you use that with your own Python. Uh, scripts, um, but I am just going to talk about uh, the three different stages uh, that we can have a look at. Uh, if you are on the GitHub repository now, uh, the example file that I have for you is uh, pulsar underscore logistic underscore sklearn.py. Um, there is another one, but that is a lot longer and a lot more uh, kind of like difficult to follow because it was um, me making one from scratch um, instead of using the much simpler way of doing it, which is just using sklearn. So uh, whenever we do any kind of AI model, we're gonna have a look at three different stages. Number one is data preparation. So the first thing that we're gonna do is import relevant libraries. So uh, you start off with your main three, which are NumPy, Pandas, Matplotlib, um, and they will handle your sort of meat of the analysis and, and uh, your visualization. We then have a few things that we want to include for this specifically. Uh, we want to get the train test split function from sklearn.model selection. Uh, we want to get the logistic regression function from sklearn.linear model. And we also, if you just, if you happen to have it, it's a, this is really good. You don't have to use this um, visualization tool, but I really like it. Um, you can get the plot learning curve function from scikit-plot.estimators. Uh, if not, then matplotlib is fine, absolutely fine. Um, and if you have questions about how to visualize using that, uh, then we can talk about that afterwards. But um, I do like this function. The first thing we want to do is create our data frame. Uh, it's a really good way of visualizing our data just anyway. Um, the way that we do that is we uh, use the read CSV function from pandas. Uh, so that will read a comma separated value uh, file. Um, if you've ever used uh, Microsoft Excel, then that's what Microsoft Excel can save their uh, um, data as. So those spreadsheets can be saved as comma separated values. It is literally how it sounds. It is a, uh, a set of values that are separated by column, uh, commas into columns. You wanna put the full path of uh, your data into there. Um, so my file is called pulsar underscore styles.csv and that's how it looks in my uh, local machine that I'm running on, uh, but it may look differently to you. Uh, it's, it's completely up to where you've, you've put that. Okay, so once we have our data frame, which should look a lot like the one that we've got uh, here, only uh, probably without these bits at the top, uh, you then want to pre-process your data ready for uh, the algorithm itself. So uh, what we're going to do then is we're going to start out by uh, making our input data, which is gonna be everything but the target class. We do not want to include the target class in our input data because all that will happen is the model will get really good at interpreting zeros and ones, which is not good for us for when we want to 
uh, add in new data later on. The goal of these models is to be able to create an algorithm that is able to take in new data where we don't know whether or not we have a pulsar uh, and spit out whether or not we do. Uh, if we just have uh, those uh, zeros and ones in that target class, all it's going to do is learn that. Uh, and that will lead to something called overfitting. Uh, now, overfitting is when our model is incredibly good at discriminating uh, the training data, but really sucks at uh, discriminating any new data. Uh, and that's not good. Ultimately, with all these algorithms, you are trying to decrease generalization error. So you want to make this model as general as possible. Okay. So the way we begin doing that is we use the dot drop function in the uh, pandas class on our data frame. And we're going to drop the target class column. And then everything else that's included, that's our data. That's our input data. That's the good stuff. We then want to move on. And we want to normalize our data. Uh, and what this uh, bit of code does here, this little bit of mathematics, is it will normalize our data to be within zero and one. And we want that because, uh, excuse me. Oh, there we go. Uh, we want that because our logistic uh, function is a sigmoid. So it goes from zero to one. So any outliers there won't be included and that's not good. So the way we do that is we take the minimum value of our data away from uh, all our data points. And then we divide that by the maximum of our data minus the minimum of our data. So that's the, the range of the data. Um, and that will get us to values between zero and one. It will have scaled it, normalized it. Um, so it will still keep some of that information. It just kind of encodes it in a new way. Um, so we still, we don't lose much when doing that. We then want to create our output. Uh, so that's our Y there. Uh, and all we're doing there is saying that our output is this target class column. Now, I've accessed the target class column uh, with just dot target class. You can do this with square brackets as well and just uh, have DF open square brackets uh, and then in quotation marks, just write target class or whatever the name of your column is. Um, I've added dot values at the end of it here. And the reason for that is not all the uh, functions that we use will be able to take a data frame column as an input. So dot values will create an array of the values of that column. Fortunately, uh, sklearn, scipy should be fine. So you should be able to just use data frame columns. However, Keras doesn't like it. TensorFlow doesn't like it. They like you to use arrays, preferably numpy arrays. Um, and you'll see that later on. But I thought I'd add this because uh, dot values will always work, but just dot column name may or may not work. Uh, so best to use dot values. Uh, the compare score thing is a hangover from when I was sort of preparing this. Uh, so basically I had all these algorithms on one file um, and I was just trying to compare them. Uh, so if you want to put them all onto one file and compare them, that might be interesting. Maybe have a look at which ones are best, which ones are kind of not that great, uh, but that's up to you. Then we move on to the final bit of data pre-preparation, which is the train test split. Now, hugely important, the ordering of this X train, X test, Y train, Y test is not arbitrary. It has to happen like this. It doesn't matter what the names are as long as you're consistent throughout your algorithm. Uh, but that is the order in, in which it goes. So do not muck up that order. Otherwise, you will have a very confusing time on your hands. Uh, now, X train and X test are, are our input data for both the training data, which is what's going to be fed into your algorithm initially, and the testing data, which will then be used to test how good your algorithm is. The same with Y train and Y test, except those will be our target classes. And the train test split function will split into training and testing data automatically, depending on what value you set test size to be. So at the moment, I have that uh, at 0 0.2. That means that 20% of my total data will be converted into my test data. Uh, 
the reason I chose that is because I'm a fan of uh, the 80 20 rule in economics. And that's literally it. That's the only reason I chose that value. Uh, in my algorithm that I've been working on for a few months now in my analysis, I have a 90 10 split. So if 90% is training, 10% is testing. I'd love to tell you that there is a mathematically rigorous way of finding the best way of doing this. There isn't, you just kind of have to guess. Um, the only hard and fast rule that we have uh, is that you do not want that test size value to be larger than 0 0.5. And I would argue that you don't want it to be larger than 0 0.4. You never want the test size to be larger than the training size. And ideally you want as much training data as possible. You do, however, want a significant amount of test data. So I would say that your best set of values are gonna be between 0 0.1 and 0 0.4 inclusive. The random state at the end there uh, just generates a seed that then the train test split function will use to be able to randomly choose which uh, rows go into uh, which category. Uh, I put that down as one, two, three. Later on in the uh, tutorial, I have uh, the random state set at 42 because I just finished reading Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy again and I was really into the number 42 because of course I was. Um, but it doesn't really matter. But the important thing is that that number stays the same. And you can set that earlier on as well. Um, to be sort of, you can say, you can use a numpy to set a random seed um, early on. But what that does is it means that whenever you run the algorithm again, it will always have the same uh, test train split. So the same data will always be put into those uh, categories, which keeps it nice and consistent. Okay, so we move on to the model creation now. Uh, in this one, we're just going to be calling the logistic regression function uh, as LR, and that basically just sets LR to be logistic regression function. Uh, we're using the simplest version of this. There are other parameters that you can use, uh, but I thought it would be useful to just show you how simple AI can be, and then you can build on that uh, in your own time, depending on what you're interested in building. After we set uh, the uh, logistic regression function, we're going to fit the function. Now, this is where the main meat of the analysis actually happens, the, the sort of bread and butter. Um, we pass it X train, which is our training data, our input data, and Y train, which is our target class. Uh, and then it will fit that data and you will get a, uh, if you're using a neural network and you're, you're going over multiple epochs, I will explain those in, in, in a bit, uh, then you'll get a readout, a consistent readout. With logistic regression though, you don't really do it over a number of epochs. It's a different kind of optimization. Um, so you, you should just get one um, line that just says it's, it's finished, or maybe even not that, but just uh, lr.fit will do this. Uh, you don't have to call it lr, you can call it whatever you want, that doesn't matter. Then after it's done that, uh, the visualization uh, should happen. So uh, I've created uh, an lr score, uh, and that just calls the score function on the logistic regression uh, class there. Uh, and we pass it the test data. So X test, Y test. Uh, don't pass the training data because uh, that's not gonna be very reliable because you've actually trained in that data. So it should be good at that. Uh, you wanna pass it the testing data, which is something it hasn't seen before. Uh, that multiplication by hundred just converts it into an easy to read percentage. I then append that to my compare score just for later, you don't have to do that at all. Uh, but with the uh, visualization, I nearly always just print my test accuracy uh, explicitly to my um, window there. Um, and then we can call the plot learning curve function, pass it the model, the X test and the Y test. And it basically does the fitting again. Uh, and then will uh, on the X test and Y test, it will produce uh, this learning curve here. Uh, after we do the PLT, I'll show. Uh, and you can see that we've got this training score and something called a cross-validation score. Cross-validation um, basically continually tests how well the model is doing uh, based on how many training examples it's analyzed. Um, and this is good. What we see here is this score is about 96% um, and stays fairly consistent. It's, uh, although we've got quite large error bars, that's what these sort of um, almost uh, transparent bits are, this sort of translucent bits. Uh, they get nice and tight as we go down. 
Um, and that's good. That means that we're getting less and less error. Um, and the fact that they do follow the same kind of distribution there also just sort of adds credence to the fact that our model is doing quite well. So uh, I will give about 10 minutes now uh, if you want to try that out yourself. Um, and if you have any questions, I realize I've kind of just word vomited at you for a good while now. Um, but we'll, now would be the time to ask some questions. Um, let me try and see if I can actually see the chat. Oh, I can. Yes, good stuff. Okay, good. Okay. Okay, so the first one that I've seen is from uh, Vanessa. How do we interpret the data set columns? Okay, great. So yeah, th this is uh, going back to here. So each of these columns will be a specific uh, feature uh, and those features will have different values based on uh, each of these rows. So each of these rows is actually a potential pulsar. Now, whether or not that's a star, whether or not that's just some other cosmological body that we're not really sure with yet, um, each one of those will have its own set of values. Um, and these are our features. So uh, each of these columns are considered um, as uh, a set of examples of uh, those features of that uh, cosmological body. Uh, and then the last one is this target class, uh, which isn't a feature of the body itself, it's what we've put there. You do have to create the target class yourself, uh, unfortunately. Um, there are ways around that. Um, and actually, interestingly enough, you can use an unsupervised algorithm to then make target classes uh, if um, you're feeling uh, particularly fancy. Okay, let's see. Ba -ba -da -ba. Uh, could you help uh, with how one could tune the model parameters to get the best score? This comes from Nadine. Yes, and we will talk about uh, tuning a little bit later on, um, but essentially the best thing to do is to run the algorithm uh, multiple times and collect the scores and just see how things change. It's somewhat, easier when it comes to doing something like logistic regression because it's quick um, and certainly yeah and, and cross validation will uh, certainly help with that as well um, you can also do something called grid search and uh, grid search is an automatic process that will take some kind of set of parameters that you give it so some parameter values um, and will essentially run the model again and again and again and again and output which is the best value for each uh, parameter. Uh, let's have a look. How do you determine the errors from Sarah? Uh, so uh, the errors are determined automatically by the algorithm and that th there's a lot of different ways to do that actually, a lot of different error functions that you can use. Most people use for something like this for a binary problem uh, and uh, an error function called binary cross entropy, binary cross entropy, which is literally as simple as uh, the, what we observe minus what we uh, expect, what we want, and then we square that, um, and that gets rid of any negative values, et cetera, and then we try and minimize that value. Uh, and we do that through this gradient descent. Um, but there are other ways of doing that. Binary cross entropy is just one. Uh, minimum squared error, as well as what I just described, really. Um, there's also, um, if you're doing, so, so what I work in at the moment, I use something called cool black, cool black, cool back Liebler divergence, which tests how close to data sets are to each other. Um, similarly, you could even use, th th there's probably a way of using things like uh, chi-squared or, or uh, Pearson rank or something like that. There's, there's lots of different errors uh, that you can do. Okay. Uh, don't see the repo has the plot learning curve. Yeah, so the plot learning curve is is um, just in scikit plot estimators, unfortunately. 
Um, I did have this problem as well, I think, with another, I completely forget all the issues whenever I finish a tutorial, I apologize. Um, oh, let me actually go back to the code again so you guys can see that. Um, yeah, so uh, plot learning curve is, is from scikit-plot estimators. If you don't want to do scikit-plot, um, then you can access the history. Um, and I will talk a little bit more about that uh, when we come to do neural networks. Um, that'll have an awful lot more on visualization because neural networks are a lot more sophisticated. And so they need a bit more of a, a sophisticated approach. Uh, they are like the special snowflakes of the uh, artificial intelligence world. Okay, let's have a look. Uh, Halima, I will try and put the GitHub repo. I'll try and make this whole presentation available um, afterwards. I'm not sure how to do that, um, but hopefully that should be able to be disseminated to everyone here. Um, yeah. Uh, Maria, if you've already installed TensorFlow and Anaconda, Keras can be within it. Uh, so you need to do that. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah that, that's, that's, that's the case. Um, I think Keras might have to be installed separately, but I think if you install Keras, it will automatically install TensorFlow, but not the other way around. Um, it's been a while since I've had to install it, so that might not be the case anymore. Okay. Uh, I think we've got some new messages down here. Ah, oh, you've got a test gap of 96.64%. Very nice. Very good. Ah. Cool, okay, so the code still works then. I'm not a complete fraud. <laughs> uh, great, 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 great. How do you decide uh, between different error checking algorithms in your experience? A good question. So it depends on what you're doing. So if you're doing a binary problem, then something like minimum squared error or binary cross entropy, that's gonna be the one to use. If you're doing, you're using something like a variational autoencoder, which is a, it's what I use at the moment. Um, it's kind of like a special case of a neural network. You need to use a mixture of um, minimum squared error and callback Leibler divergence. Um, if you are going to use a Bayesian inference network, you're going to need to use something Bayesian. So um, Bayesian estimators. The best thing that you can do for yourself if you're going to go into data science is to have a look at a uh, a statistical data analysis uh, book. So try and read something by a man called Glenn Cowan. He is, he taught me um, and is kind of like the, the guru, guru of uh, statistical data analysis. I work with many, many, many different particle physicists uh, and astronomers, and I have never met anyone to this day uh, who doesn't know who Glenn Cowan is. He is like, ah, oh, man's a genius. Um, but just learn some statistical data analysis um, and it will stand you in really good stead. If you don't like maths, it's gonna be a bit of a slog, but seriously, keep going with it. Take as much time as you need. There are no heroes in maths. Um, just trudge on, because it, it is a really good thing to do. Uh, okay. What are options for optimization other than SGD nowadays? Ah, oh, Lauren, fantastic question. Um, so it's a, off the top of my head, it's a modified version of SGD essentially, but it is a directed thing. So stochastic uh, for people that don't know, basically means um, stepwise and random. Okay, um, so there are now approaches where we've kind of done an awful lot of analysis ever since the 80s really on optimization using things like statistic, uh, stochastic gradient descent. So now we have a better idea of how to direct that a bit better. Um, so I think there are people currently working on um, stochastic gradient descent that kind of has a machine learning algorithm built in that learns as it goes along what the best way of finding a local minimum is and optimizing. Um, it's very, very recent. So we are talking sort of, I, I think it might have been 2018, 20, 
maybe even 2019, the most recent one. So there are papers on archive if you're interested in reading about that sort of thing. Uh, but it's a super interesting field because if it does work, then it, it speeds algorithms up an awful lot more. Uh, is there any some data leakage because the data is scaled? Liz, absolutely. There is definitely data, data leakage. Thankfully, because we're using primarily numerical data here, it shouldn't be that much of a problem. Um, when you start to use categorical data and you start to use doing things like one hot encoding, um, that then starts to be a bit difficult uh, and data leakage can be a real issue if uh, you have a lot of outliers. You can imagine that trying to fit extreme cases is a lot more difficult than trying to fit uh, data that are, is quite bunched together uh, because the data, the, the model is able to learn from uh, the majority of the data rather than the minority. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, so that's it. Yeah, so our prop is a, is a really good one. It's a modified SGD. Um, explain like I'm five SGD. Okay, all right, okay. So you are at the top of a hill. Uh, the, the, as you go down the hill, there are a bunch of dips and valleys and things like that. Um, so the best way of you, if you are completely blind of getting down that hill to, the, to a, uh, a, uh, a point where you may be able to pitch a tent, for instance, is to just keep going um, far down the hill in the direction where you can feel a bigger gradient, okay? Now, the point at which you stop is when you can feel only uh, positive gradients. So when you get to a kind of like a dip like this, right? Now, if you're going in a random direction, it might be that you accidentally go uphill a couple of times and that can happen S SGD, but then it will take a completely like 180 and it will just go down the opposite direction. Um, and the question that you may be asking is, well, how do I know that I found like sea level? How do I know I found the absolute best minimum value? There is no way. And when I say there is no way, I mean that if you find a way of finding a global minimum, email me so I can steal it from you, scoop it from you and win millions of pounds <laughs> because there is no mathematically rigorous way of doing that yet. Uh, there are people working on it, but it is a bit of a problem. So you're most likely going to find a local minimum. If you do happen to stumble upon a global minimum for God's sake, remember what random seed you use uh, because you'll be able to use that and ride those coattails for forever. Um, but you should imagine it like you're climbing down a hill and trying to find that local minimum. Okay, so last question for now from Vanessa. Uh, what are the characteristics in the data set that must be met for a star to be considered a pulsar? From the top of my head, I actually don't know that one. Um, I'm not an astrophysicist, uh, but I imagine that it's gonna be a mixture of a few things. So what I would say is mass, which will mean that you're gonna to have to look at gravitational lensing, so how light is bent around, because uh, the mass is very indicative. So it has to be at least eight times the size of our own star has to be in terms of mass. Another one will be how fast it's spinning. They spin very, very quickly because you have to conserve something called angular momentum as it spins and very, very big. If you've ever sat on like a, a spinny chair, like the one I'm on now, uh, if you hold your arms out, you spin a lot slower than if you pull them in. That's because it's a conservation of angular momentum. So you make yourself bigger, uh, you have to use more energy to, to, to uh, whisk yourself around, smaller, more energy can be used to, to conserve that angular momentum like that. Um, also, how collimated, so how uh, narrow your radiation is, huge, huge indicator. Very, very, very powerful neutron stars, very powerful. So there won't be an awful lot of dispersion of radiation. If you have a, a light bulb, for instance, you can kind of draw lines from a light bulb and it'll go like that and the light will do this. That's because light bulbs aren't particularly good at radiation uh, control. Pulsars are very good at radiation control. So they'll be very collimated. They're almost like lasers in a way. Um, okay, do you know what actually, one last question, because this was a very good one, uh, how to automate cleaning. Put it into this algorithm, that will automatically do it. 
build pipelines. So build pipelines to do this, um, but you do have to just kind of understand your data before you clean it. Um, um, I recommend that you look at sort of some data cleaning courses because they're really useful. Okay, before I start answering everyone's questions, uh, because they are some very interesting ones, let's move on. So I keep asking questions. I will come to them when we have our next sort of break. Uh, hopefully you guys managed to get to grips with linguistic regression because we are moving on to what is what has been for I think God 15, 20 years how we do uh, data science when it comes to particle physics and that's decision trees. Oh, the stories these decision trees could tell, let me tell you. Uh, now, decision trees uh, work on a bunch of successive cuts. So if we look on the left here, uh, we can imagine that we have some data set. They want to split that into, for instance, um, uh, say background and signal events. So if I uh, have some interesting data that I want to find, I call that my signal. If I have boring data that I want to throw away and never look at again, that would be my background. So I pass it into a first cut and I say, well, the data is below a value of 10, whatever that 10 happens to be. Uh, and it splits it into this sort of true or false here, right? And then we go and we say, well, Y is less than zero, and it splits it again. Z is greater than five, splits it again. Y is greater than zero, splits it again. And hopefully we end up with what we've got on the right-hand side here, which is this splitting of the data into background and signal. So if we were to uh, do, you know, zero is our background, one is our signal, as we have with the um, not a pulsar and pulsar example, uh, all the red dots uh, and the sort of tan areas, those kind of sort of yellowy areas, those are our uh, background. And uh, the blue areas and the, the green dots are our signal. And we can see that it, the data set's kind of been divided up. Uh, and it's been pretty, you know, pretty good at this. You, know, you see an awful lot of dots in the uh, background. However, the astute amongst you will also see that there are some misclassifications. So we've got some very naughty people over here, uh, some uh, naughty green dots as well. This is not good, this is not great, we don't like this. Unfortunately, that is one of the issues with decision trees. So whilst those successive cuts are good, often very, very good, especially when you put many decision trees in parallel with each other, we call that a random forest for obvious reasons, um, we're only going to get background-like and signal-like events. So one of the people in the chat managed to get a uh, algorithm that had 96% accuracy. That still means you got 4% error. Uh, just to clarify, very good score, don't worry about that. But you still have that, that error, right? You're still gonna have some points that are misclassified. And this will happen in a decision tree. Now, an issue is uh, that they, are sort of prone to overfitting. So you can imagine that these sort of shapes are very specific to this data set. Um, and they may have a generalization error that's quite large. Uh, and this is partly because they make only locally optimal decisions. So when I say locally optimal, I mean that every single one of these stages here does not care about previous stages. Now, sometimes that's okay, sometimes that's fine. You can see that this algorithm still performs pretty well. Um, and we use locally optimal decisions um, in cutting edge analysis. Something called Markov chain Monte Carlo simulation is how we simulate the Large Hadron Collider, right? Um, locally optimal decisions can be described as if you're driving along a road and you're trying to get to your destination. Uh, Maybe the left turn is the shortest way of getting to some kind of uh, a petrol station or something on the way. Um, but it might be that the right hand turn, though quicker, so though longer, sorry, leads you to actually having a shorter journey overall because it gets you to a shortcut. So it, it may be that locally optimal decisions aren't actually the best thing for you. And also the, the decision tree isn't very robust, which means that Variations in the initial data can uh, result in wildly different outcomes. However, 
that does require very little data preparation, which is an advantage. Uh, it can handle very large data sets. It's just making successive cuts. Uh, it can be used for both classification and regression. Um, it can get just values out, or we can put those values into a classification. And they're very simple to understand and interpret. These are what we call uh, white box models. Um, and we will talk about black box models when it comes to neural networks. Uh, but that's because this is not a simplified version of a decision tree. This is a decision tree. This is perfectly acceptable as a decision tree. Um, this can be used to describe you know, really high level analysis. And this is a perfectly acceptable output uh, for a decision tree. Now, if we want to get rid of some of these disadvantages, what we can do is boost our decision tree using something called ADA boost. ADA is based on the ADAM optimizer, which is a uh, sort of industry standard optimization algorithm. And what that does is it takes each of these lines here uh, and it assigns a weight to them. And then once we have a decision tree run through, uh, we will collect an error at the end, as we did with logistic regression and as we're going to do with neural networks. Uh, and then it will compare that error to um, some kind of uh, value that we actually want to get out. So some kind of acceptable error rate. And it will then uh, take that error and sort of see which of these cuts are performing really well, which of these cuts are really good at discrimination. Uh, and in the next stage of the optimization, it will give an awful lot more credence, a lot more of its computational power to the weights that are performing very well. The uh, decisions are not very good. Uh, and we take all of that data and then we create a brand new decision tree, very similar to the one that we have, but with different weightings. Uh, and then we pass all the data through that again. We collect an error rate. We adjust the weights again through stochastic gradient descent. And we keep going, we keep going, we keep going until that error rate is at an acceptable level. And that is our boosted decision tree. And that has been the meat of the analysis. I know I keep using that term, but it's a good way of describing it. It's been the meat of the particle physics analysis at CERN for God knows how long. Um, these are very, very good because they provide you with this kind of white box, this very transparent way of looking at things. So we move on now to some code. You can see it gets a little bit more complicated now. We're sort of ramping up that difficulty, but not too much, don't worry. Uh, the example file in the GitHub repo is pulsar underscore bdt um, dot py. Uh, so the data preparation is much the same, except that we're going to have the decision tree classifier uh, from sklearn. We're going to have the ADA boost classifier, which does our boosting. Uh, and we're going to be using metrics instead of lr.score. So we can't use uh, this anymore because the uh, guess it regression function, that's just specific to that. Uh, we want to use metrics instead. Does exactly the same thing though, guys. It's just metrics.accuracyscore under uh, there. Uh, we read in the data once again using the same uh, read CSV. Uh, and I'm just going to show you here another way of doing this data pre-preparation. So uh, if we want to just have um, our features, which is our input data, where it's going to inform our input data, we access our data frame. So that's this uh, data here uh, with data.columns. Now data.columns will create an array of uh, column names. Uh, and that's all the columns in the data. So this will be uh, nine values long because it will have all the, the columns that we have for this specific one. Uh, and then I want to access all of the data except the last one, right? We don't want that target class involved. Uh, and the way that we do that is we have uh, a colon. Uh, and before that, you can write zero. And that will start it at the first element of that column, uh, that column array. But you don't have to because it will automatically assume you mean you want to start from the beginning, but if you want to be consistent, put zero there. I am lazy, so I didn't. Uh, and then you want to have uh, up until minus one. That minus one always selects, always selects the very last element of your column array or any array actually. Uh, if you just had minus one there and didn't have the colon, uh, this would just return uh, this target class column, which would be your output. So that's another way of doing this as well. Uh, for some reason, when you count from left to right in an array, um, it starts at zero. 
when you count from right to left, it starts at minus one, and then we'll go to minus two, minus three, minus four, minus five. Um, you know, I've petitioned for it to be minus zero, but apparently that's stupid, you know, who knows. Uh, we can then create our input data, which is just gonna be uh, accessing our data frame. And then we can pass a data frame in these square brackets, uh, an entire list of columns. And what this does is essentially just says to the, uh, the uh, uh, data pre-processing, uh, our input data is just those eight columns are the features. Okay, our output data is just going to be accessing the target class. Note I haven't written dot values here, just to show you that it will work without dot values in some cases, um, but you can just add dot values at the end there, but that's basically the same thing. We then go once again for this train test split. You can see that I've used 42 instead. Um, always remember your towel, don't panic. Uh, make sure that if you're going to have a, a spaceship, that you've got uh, infinite probability drive. Always a good way of doing things. Then we wanna create our model using a decision tree classifier, and that's gonna be encapsulated. It's gonna be surrounded by this Ada boost classifier. You can just use, if you wish, a decision tree, a single decision tree. I tested that, and there is actually a version in the uh, GitHub repo. Um, I think that's just pulsar underscore DT from memory. Um, and that will work pretty well, actually, with this one. It won't be as good as the uh, booster decision tree, but for this data, it's all numerical. Um, the data is fairly close to each other. It's a fairly sort of even distribution um, of things. It will work pretty well here. Um, but the Ada boost is the better way of doing this. Uh, we then want to fit the data. Uh, and once again, that will perform this analysis, really. That's, that's, the, actually, that's the algorithm actually working. Uh, and then we want to not, <laughs> not product, we want to predict <laughs> the response for the test data set. Uh, sorry about that. My, English teacher parents are going to kill me. Um, and we create this kind of prediction score uh, based on our X uh, testing data, so our input test data. And that won't just create one prediction, um, that will create an array of predictions uh, for the output. And then we can use that in our visualization. So we create a score by using metrics.accuracy underscore, underscore score, uh, and pass it the testing data, the testing output, and the predicted output. And it will use, uh, in this instance, probably minimum squared error, although it may use binary cross entropy. The two are effectively the same thing anyway. Um, I multiply that by 100 to once again get a percentage. And I round all that using the inbuilt round function in Python. You don't have to do that. And I, I've seen some of your scores in the chat which haven't been rounded. Totally fine. Absolutely, completely fine. Um, I just like the look of two decimal places. Um, so we then just print our score and then print our learning curve again. And this is a fantastic way of looking at how uh, Joe can completely screw up a uh, output. So this is our cross validation score. It stays at uh, perfect. And this is our Sorry, this is our training score, and then our cross-validation score uh, varies a little bit more. I am incredibly skeptical of anything that is 100% accurate in, in any of my life. If someone says they are you know, 100% in love with me, that's a problem. Uh, very uh, concerned with 100% accuracy. <laughs> uh, but in this instance, it's actually not too bad because again, like I said, numerical data it's, it's fairly evenly distributed, it's okay, okay? Um, but in this instance, we're probably better off looking at the cross-validation score for an accurate description of our, uh, how our model is uh, performing. Uh, but we do see that it's between 96 and 97% accurate. Um, I know that with some tweaking, you can make it, I think 98% is the highest I got. Um, and that tweaking would happen uh, very likely in the parameters for the decision tree a function or the ADA boost classifier function. Um, again, I'm not gonna do any parameter tweaking here just to show you that just bare bones AI can be very, very powerful. Um, but you can have a look at documentation and I absolutely urge you to go and read documentation if you're confused or if you wanna um, get better to grips with things. Documentation is key, always read documentation. It's boring, I know it's boring, it sucks, I've had to write it myself, but it is very useful. 
Okay, so once again, I'll give you about 10 minutes to, to write this algorithm yourself and to ask any questions. Okay. By the way, if I'm speaking too fast, um, I've been told that I speak too quickly, uh, please do let me know. Oh, did someone try a random forest test like yours? Oh, brilliant. Okay, cool, 98%. Brilliant, that's great. Uh, da -da -da -da. Uh, Asha has said, which tool could be used to deal with a large image data? Let's say 400 gigabytes. Woof. Okay, so 400 gigabytes is going to be very difficult to deal with. Um, but for images, there are a few uh, sort of tricks that you can use. Convolutional neural networks are going to be your friend, uh, Asha. It's probably best to use uh, CNNs for this sort of thing. Um, they're just very accurate. However, if you want something that is just going to be quicker, um, and well, not necessarily quicker, but certainly something that is a little bit more mm, able to deal with the large data sets um, easily. BDTs are fine. You are going to have a rough time with 400 gigabytes of data, though. So at that point, there's not much you can do in terms of the software. What you've then got to do is have a look at getting yourself um, a GPU rather than a CPU. Um, getting access to GPU farms. So Google Colab is pretty good for this. That's probably going to mean that you're going to have to spend money on that um, and actually buy time on a GPU farm. Um, but for instance, I've got so this, this laptop is what I do most of my um, analysis on because I can use my university cluster. So that's another good one as well. Uh, try and get on a university cluster or an analysis cluster. If you um, so AWS from Amazon is pretty good for this. Um, so is Facebook. Admittedly, the companies might be evil, but the resources are top notch. Um, Google, like I said, very good for this. Um, so buying time on those is probably your best bet. Um, my PC, my desktop has a GPU, which, which um, might be able to deal with tens of gigabytes of data, but that would still be an issue. So your best bet is hardware rather than software. Also, parallelization is key. Multi-threading, fantastic. I'm not going to go into that too much here, but basically your PC, if, you're, if it has, say, eight cores, so eight CPU cores, so if you ever hear like, um, like Pentium core or quad core processing, that means you've got four cores. Usually, you're only actually going to be using one of those when you do your analysis, and the rest of them are going to be ticking over in the background doing other processes. But what you can do is you can... Um, have multi-threading so you can have a process that doesn't need say if you have uh, processes that don't necessarily need to have data from the previous process to work uh, you can set them running concurrently on each core so each core is working on its own and then uh, when each core has finished its job it will wait until the other one's done and then you can go on to the next thing uh, rather than doing what um, cores usually do uh, which is just run things um, in order. Uh, but those, those are your best bets. But for 400 gigabytes, that sort of thing, hardware, not software. Uh, oh, look at these accuracy scores, loving it. Uh, what could be the minimum hardware requirements, RAM and cores? Okay, so good question. Um, you want to go for uh, something like eight gigabytes of RAM. Um, in terms of cores, probably quad core is probably your, your base. Uh, eight gigabytes of RAM is really good. Um, 16 gigs is better. 32 gigs might be overkill, but you know if you've got the money, why not? Um, and then you also want uh, processing speed. So uh, if you're using Intel, then Intel i5 and above for machine learning, that's good. Um, the latest chips you can find are probably best. You don't have to spend a ridiculous amount of money, um, but if you want to do data science, you are going to have to um shell out quite a bit so the laptop that i'm on right now is uh, about 800 pounds my desktop pc was about a grand um but if you can get access to clusters that'll help um for sure do you recommend building your own pc for ml and which specs would you recommend in 2021 um yeah yeah do it um certainly though if you can get a laptop 
if you can get a laptop running Linux, so I'm running Linux at the moment, that's really good. Um, I hate to say it because I've, I've never been particularly into Apple, but Apple really good for programming. Apple is based on the Unix shell, which, which Linux is as well. Um, so uh, as much as I'm not a huge Apple fan, uh, they, they do make good stuff. <laughs> they do make good stuff. Um, so that would be quite good. If you're going to build a PC, your spec should be around about eight gigabytes of RAM, between eight and 16. Uh, you want a GPU and buy the latest that you can. So uh, GTX 2060, GTX, GTX or RTX 2060, 2080 is good, or 3020 if you can get them. The, th the 3000 series are really good. Um, then you want, uh, don't skimp, don't do what I did and be an idiot and skimp on the Wi-Fi adapter as well. Um, I initially paid 15 pounds for one and then within the first week I'd replaced it with a 40, 50 pound one because it's just night and day in the difference. Um, processing power, you want, um, like I said, Intel i5 or above and then make sure that you have the correct heat sinks and fans and things like that. Um, yeah. uh, 16 gig RAM, eight cores, GeForce RTX with some models amounts of data it still suffers. Yeah, absolutely. And it will do. I mean, I mean, my PC still suffers with some of the stuff that I do. Um, and that's why I do say that sometimes you are just going to have to buy time with G, uh, GPU farms. I say this from an incredibly privileged uh, position because um, we have quite a few of those at CERN. We've always been on the cutting edge of things. Um, some people are going to argue with me on this point, but CERN invented the internet uh, in the 80s. So we've always had the money to do so. Um, yeah, you do need a powerful GeForce graphics card on top of that, especially if you're doing image recognition. For just numerical data, Intel is fine, but you know, not so much. You could also look into Spark. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, Jess. Uh, uh, Spark is fantastic for that sort of thing. Um, Hadoop as well, uh, MongoDB, um, any kind of data warehousing, data analysis software like that um, that uses SQL. Learning SQL would be a really good idea. Mm -mm -mm. Maria, absolutely the case. It's always better to build your own PC because you can, you can take stuff out and replace it as well. This laptop I didn't actually buy. This was because my PhD um, people, so QM well knew that I was going to be using um, a lot of sort of high level analysis. They bought me one, but my PC I paid for myself uh, because I just wanted to build something like that. Uh, mine is enough for Kaggle competitions, although um, I've not taken part in them, but I have set up I'm setting up one now with my analysis team. But yeah, it would be perfectly acceptable. You're not going to be able to compete with things like, um, like for instance, if you have like the world championships of uh, image recognition, I think um, you're not going to be able to compete because those guys are using Google software um, and Google gets involved, which I don't think is very fair, quite frankly. I don't think that Google getting involved in competitions on Kaggle should be allowed, but you know, whatever, that's fine. Um, I will say though that I have built the award-winning algorithm on this device and <laughs> it did work, but one epoch, so one run of the algorithm took an hour. <laughs> so <laughs> take it with a pinch of salt. <laughs> Um, Tim, yeah, yeah, so, yeah, this is the thing. He, he, he invented the first web page, but the, the software involved, and certainly the connectivity hardware and stuff like that, that was CERN. Um, we invented the first scientific internet, but the first commercial internet was Tim. Um, I can't remember his last name now. But yeah, they, they invented the first one. Uh, basically, uh, interestingly enough, fun fact, um, the first ever web page was actually t uh, an advert for Tim's wife's uh, a singing group. Um, and I believe you can actually still find uh, that online somewhere. And it's like archived somewhere. It's very interesting. Mm -hmm. Maria, I think you should uh, upgrade your RAM first and then your GeForce card. I think. But yeah, both at the same time is good. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, that's it. Tim Berners Lee, there we go, there we go. He was, uh, I think he was actually um, celebrated in the 
2012 Olympics, right? I think. One hour in epoch should have been around for neural nets in the early days. <laughs> I have watched um, that there's a, there's a very good video online where uh, Jan Lekun um, showcases the very first um, convolutional neural network classifier. And apparently that took days to train. And I think that might have been the 80s. I'm not even sure if that was in, uh, no, it was a neural net. Um, and very impressive, but it, I was like, God, days, days. Uh, recently, actually, um, a lot of people, a lot of physicists are getting involved in, in biology, computational biology, because the stuff that we create, so CERN, for instance, is on the cutting edge of um, artificial intelligence research, as you can imagine, because we need to be to, in order to analyze all this data. So because we uh, have a really good sort of understanding of those kind of algorithms and, and AI in general, um, a lot of biological problems have actually been solved by um, uh, physicists, or at least physicists working with biologists. I'm not going to pretend to understand um, things like protein folding. That's beyond my remit. I think that in terms of difficult scientific problem, protein folding is probably worse than dark matter, which is saying something. Um, but uh, recently, uh, one of the people in my department um, actually managed to make an algorithm that uh, helps with biological understanding. It, it, it lowered, um, I think, runtime from days to hours. And also, um, recently, a, a protein folding problem was solved by um, Google DeepMind, which is comprised of a lot of different kinds of data scientists, uh, physicists, mathematicians, that sort of thing, which is huge. Protein folding is a very, very interesting area of AI research. Please, 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 if you're interested in AI, do go look up protein folding. Um, it is essentially, explain like I'm five, um, is essentially, uh, imagine if you were trying to make an origami swan, but you were trying to do all the, cu the cuts and folds to actually make a real living swan. That, that's that's the, the level of difficulty that you're dealing with. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, Google DeepMind is, is fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. Um, okay, so let's move on to the last algorithm. Um, so that we can sort of have some more discussion afterwards because I am loving these questions. Okie dokie, so now we get on to the sexiest algorithm, the artificial neural network. This is the one that everyone always loves to espouse. Um, it's the one that I work with most often. Uh, so neural networks are so named because they are in fact based on the neural networks of the brain. Um, so for instance, your eye has a selection of, uh, of rod cells, which have a look at uh, black and white, so light and dark. And you also have a set of cone cells, which have a look at color. Um, and if you're like me, you need a pair of these glasses because your cone cells really aren't pulling their weight and you're incredibly colorblind. Um, but supposedly they work in other people. I wouldn't know. Uh, now, when you have light that comes into your eyes, uh, photons will enter your eye, they will interact with one of these cells, and if enough photons interact with a cell, it will send a signal uh, once it reaches this threshold. And if enough of those signals um, get over that threshold, that bias, which we'll talk about in a second, that bias, uh, it will send a cascading signal through your uh, neural network in your brain. And that's what this is based on. So every artificial neural network has an input layer, a hidden layer, and an output layer. Now the input layer is so named because it is this input set of features and you'll have uh, each of these little circles here represent something called a neuron. Uh, we call them neurons based again on the brain um, and you will have as many neurons in your initial layer as you have features. So for this algorithm we're going to have eight uh, neurons here because we have eight input features. You will then have a hidden layer. Now the hidden layer is so named because it is a bit mysterious. Um, it doesn't allow much uh, to a transparency. And this is where we get this kind of black box model. The hidden layer must have at least as many uh, neurons as in your input layer, preferably a lot more. 
Um, if you can make it wide, that's great. If you can add more hidden layers, even better. Deep neural networks are an area of very interesting research at the moment. Um, but what they will do is they will split the data once again um, and kind of fit the data to um, different weights and different, uh, um, uh, they'll create their own uh, functions to fit the data. The output then has as many features as you have output features. In this particular example, you might think that those that will have two outputs as well because we've got zero or one but actually you do perfectly well with just one. Uh, and the reason for that is because we're using a sigmoid and it's a continuous function, okay? Uh, and because it's a continuous function, all I have to say is that any value 0 0.5 and above counts as one, any value 0 0.49 recurring and below will count as zero. And then we can just say that there's one output neuron um, and that allows the algorithm to sort of run a bit faster. Now, each of these neurons uh, fits a function. So their output is y on the, uh, the left-hand side here. And the function is essentially a summation. So this y here, this output, um, is a summation of weights. So this w, uh, i, and x, i is what is here, OK? So this, this line and this uh, feature is a weighting. And you sum the weights, you sum the features, um, and you have a bias as well, some initial bias, uh, and then you have a function of those. So maybe it's a sigmoid function, maybe it's a minimum squared error, maybe it's a Bayesian inference, so you have a Bayesian uh, function there. Um, it depends what you uh, need to do for your network. And that uh, output will be fitting that function to the data, or fitting the, uh, fitting the function to the data. Yeah. Sorry, fitting the data to that function. Then, once you reach the outputs, so once you do a full pass through the model, you'll then calculate error based on what I talked about previously, binary cross entropy, minimum squared error, blah, 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 uh, which error, whichever error function uh, that you're going to be using. And you will then do gradient descent on two things at the same time. Number one is your weighting, okay? So you can see this gamma value and this function, you're doing uh, your error, this E stands for error. So you're doing the differential of error with respect to weights and differential of error with respect to biases. So you've also got to change your thresholds. So uh, how sensitive is each neuron going to be um, and how strong is each neuron going to be? The strength comes from the weighting, the sensitivity comes from the bias. And you do this uh, gradient descent, first of all, for these weights and these features here. So basically you tell the model, you say, okay, well, this error is pretty bad. This error is pretty bad. So we need to adjust the weights thusly to make the error better. Uh, and if I want to adjust the weight here at the output layer, what kind of weight adjustments do I need to make in the hidden layer in order to make that uh, uh, happen? And then the hidden layer says, well, you know, that that's not necessarily the, the full picture because I need to also adjust the weights in the input layer as well and how that information reaches us. And so I'll adjust the weights uh, from the hidden layer to the uh, input layer, uh, and then we get a full description of how we can adjust the model. So that's called back propagation. Uh, if you want to sort of uh, understand that a little bit more and look that up, that's back propagation. And that's how uh, artificial neural networks will optimize. There are many different ways of doing that. Um, we, I think we're going to be, let's see. Uh, yeah, we're gonna be using the Adam optimizer today, but there's um, uh, root mean squared propagators. Um, there's uh, lots of different ways of, of uh, optimizing our algorithm. So this has a lot of different advantages, artificial neural networks. Uh, it's among the most accurate of modeling approaches. It is the most sophisticated approach to this day. It's the most sophisticated approach uh, neural network. Um, it will get you the most accuracy, the highest accuracy. Um, it's useful for both classification and regression. So uh, we can actually have this be, um, if, we, if we were gonna do image data sets, if we were gonna say, you know, uh, that same example of, uh, are we looking at Helen or Helen's cat? Uh, we would have uh, two 
uh, uh, classes there, uh, Helen, Helen's cat, uh, and uh, we would just have a classification algorithm or we could do a regression algorithm, uh, which is basically what we're doing today. Um, I should say that because we've got a binary problem today, I think I might have mentioned this before, but it bears repeating. Because we've got a binary problem today, this is both a classification and a regression model. It would work for both, work for either. Um, but if you've got you know, multiple different things, so cats, dogs, planes, trains, cars, bikes, buses, that sort of thing, um, then you would have to add in way more classes. And the number of uh, classes of objects that you have or things uh, would be the number of outputs uh, neurons that you have, so in this layer. It also makes very few assumptions about relationships in the data. A neural network does not care uh, what kind of relationships are already in the data, much the same way as a human will do. Um, if you have a look at a, a child learning mathematics, um, they will learn essentially by repetition, right? So two times two is four, four times four is 16, you know, and, and so on and so on. Um, however, once you get to sort of higher level mathematics, you start to actually learn um, how to connect different languages. So for instance, you may connect uh, algebra with geometry uh, and make, you know, topology. Uh, you may uh, connect group theory with gauge theory, uh, and you've got basically the entirety of uh, particle physics. Uh, and there are sort of other different ways of doing things, but it goes up in complexity there, but it makes very few assumptions about that data initially. It is one of the more computationally intensive algorithms. It, depending on what you have, it might not be that computationally intensive, and the one today isn't going to be. Uh, and there are other algorithms like support vector machines that are sort of that match it in terms of computational intent, computational intensity. Uh, but you essentially have to have this trade-off, right, of uh, how much computing power do you have, how much time do you have, <coughs> versus um, mm, how accurate you want your algorithm to be. It's easy to over or under train the data because it is so strong at discrimination, it can over and under train. And there are ways around that. If you um, want to do image recognition, for instance, you can add things like dropout. So that will randomly get rid of 20%, 25% of neurons in the hidden layer, um, which basically it's like culling the herd. So uh, it, it almost sort of scares the rest of the neurons and says, oh God, you know, I, I better start pulling my weight um, and it will uh, give them more discrimination power. Um, you can do that randomly or you can do that um, using a pre-designed set of dropouts. Um, ultimately though, what we have here is a black box model. Black boxes is something that you're going to hear multiple times in uh, uh, machine learning, and it's it's a bit of a problem. So what this means is the hidden layer, we can't actually peek inside that because every single time we improve upon our algorithm, every single time we perform uh, back propagation for an epoch. So an epoch, by the way, is a, a forward pass collecting the error, backward pass for this back propagation. That's one full epoch. You can imagine it like um, swimming uh, a length forward and back across a pool. So if you arrive at your original position, that's one epoch. Uh, but the hidden layer will change. The hidden layer will change functional forms. It will change weights. It will change biases, but we won't actually be able to probe that. The only thing that we can probe is the input and output. Um, there are ways of kind of trying to understand uh, the hidden layer by using adversarial networks are kind of trying to break the hidden layer trying to break the model and seeing how it breaks but it's still a black box model and i can't really think of any way that we're going to be able to peer inside that that's usually okay so for instance we use artificial neural networks in physics if we want to find uh, electrons or muons or tauons or pions or, or different particles that we know very well the properties and distributions of if we're trying to find new physics, we want to use something like a boosted decision tree because that's very, very, very transparent. If we're trying to look for things that we already have, then neural networks. So it's very good for isolating backgrounds, not particularly good for finding out what a signal is. Um, but there are 
like I said, adversarial networks. And, and we'll, we'll talk about that at the end if we have time, because uh, it's a very, very interesting um, thing to look at. Okay, so this actually requires two slides <laughs> for the three stages, because it's a little bit more complex. The data preparation side though, is um, uh, pretty much the same. We're going to include standard scalar because I'm going to show you a really cheaty way of uh, uh, manipulating your data and normalizing it. Um, we're going to use the, uh, for the first time, Keras. So we're going to access sequential from Keras. We're going to access the dense layer from Keras. Uh, confusion matrix from sklearn will allow us to get an idea of how well our model is performing. Uh, and once again, the plot learning curve. So we read in our data, we pass it over to our um, creation of our data. So X data, we just have our features, once again, our feature columns. And then we're gonna cheat. We are going to uh, put our values in between zero and one by using something called standard scalar, which does, take my word for it, exactly this algorithm. Sorry, uh, sorry, exactly this, okay? That's exactly that. That's all it does, except it's a much faster way of doing it because it's been optimized already. Um, it's, it's got the sort of like the cutting edge of, of whatever the best thing to do in Python is for that. Um, you then want to fit transform the data and that will just fit the data to the standard scalar, the sort of like normalization there. Uh, and then once again, we're going to access our target class. Notice that I've put the dot values there. That's because Keras hates uh, data frames. It does not like data frames at all. Um, uh, we then pass it to the train test split to uh, split our data. Uh, and we start out with our model creation. Now we're going to have one input layer, one hidden layer, one output layer. There has been mathematical proof that any function, any function can be, sorry, any function can be um, fit to an arbitrary accuracy with three hidden layers. You don't need to use that many today. We're just going to be using one hidden layer. If you want to increase the accuracy, you either increase the number of neurons in your hidden layers or increase the number of hidden layers um, just overall. We're going to have eight features, one output, as I explained previously. So we've got eight uh, neurons and one output neuron. And we're going to have a minimum of eight neurons in the hidden layer because that's what we need. We, we can't be uh, doing this classification uh, and lowering the number of neurons. You can do this if you're using something like an autoencoder, which lowers, uh, it basically allows for transmission of data by, by uh, lowering the amount of data you have, but we're not gonna touch on that today. We're also gonna include a validation set. Now what that does is a validation set will need to be done here. So we essentially take 33% of our test data and after every single epoch, we run our validation data uh, and we get a running score for how well our model is doing. And that really, really, really helps with this idea of overfitting. Um, and it'll take that into account. And it sort of shows us whether or not we're overfitting. So uh, we first of all have our classifier, which is gonna be a sequential model, which basically just means input, hidden output, sequence, sequence, sequence. Uh, we add a dense layer with eight features. We're going to use the ReLU activation function. Uh, the activation function is this thing here. So this is our activation function, okay, for each neuron. We're going to use ReLU. Now, ReLU um, basically will be uh, zero, be a zero value for anything below the threshold. And then as soon as you get above the threshold, you'll have uh, your input equal your output for your, for your data. Um, that doesn't necessarily inform the weights, uh, but it's a very, very, very good way of uh, using that. It's a very good uh, activation function, sorry. Um, uh, leaky ReLU is also very good, but ReLU is kind of like industry, industry standard. I can't really go, I don't really have enough time to go um, off on different activation functions, but we've met today sigmoid and ReLU. And we'll be using sigmoid again, um, but there are so many different activation functions. And this is just a parameter that you're going to have to tweak yourself um, and something else that you can actually do in grid search. My kernel initializer is random normal by default, uh, but uh, that just basically means we fit it to like a Gaussian. 
the Gaussian distribution, which is uh, often called a normal distribution. Um, but you don't have to specify because uh, it usually does Gaussian uh, on its own. And then we give it the input dimensions that will set that usually to the number of features we have, but I, I thought I'd be specific here just so you can see it. We then have our second layer. So that's our uh, hidden layer. Again, you can see that we've added a dense layer uh, with eight uh, neurons. We can add more if we wish, but eight is fine for this. Um, and we stick with the same sort of uh, activation and kernel initializers. We then have a classifier. Uh, sorry, so we then add our final layer, which is the output. So we've got one output neuron, which is going to take values from between zero and one, which we've already made with our standard scalar. Uh, and our activation function is going to be a sigmoid, and that will fit in with our zero to one uh, values. Um, you can also do um, a tanch function if you wish. Uh, but then you'd have to set your scaling to be between minus one and one, but that's perfectly acceptable. If you have minus values in your data, it's much better to use a tanch function, which is a hyperbolic tan function. Uh, and then we do the same kernel initializer for, uh, the, the kernel initializer will initialize our weights. So uh, we initialize weights to be Gaussian. Uh, if you have already a set of weights in mind, you can use those as well, and that's where you would put those. We then want to compile the model. Uh, we're going to have an Adam optimizer, which is pretty much the same kind of optimizer that we use for um, booster decision tree. So it keeps a running um, uh, vector of weights and it keeps adding to those. Our loss function is going to be binary cross entropy, which is this minimum squared error that I've been talking about. Uh, and our, mat uh, bleh, metric, our metric is going to be accuracy. Uh, and we'll talk more about that when we come to visualization. Uh, we then want to fit our classifier. This history thing here is going to be uh, on the next slide, and I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, but we want to fit our classifier using the uh, training data. We're going to add this validation split. Batch size. Now, this is another hyperparameter that you're going to need to tweak yourself. But basically, it sets how many uh, data points it takes in at once. Um, if you set it higher, the algorithm will be quicker. Uh, but it won't be as accurate. If you set it lower, it will be slower, um, but it might overtrain. So you kind of have to uh, sort of tweak that yourself. Again, there's no mathematically rigorous way of figuring that out. And then the number of epochs for how long it runs. Again, there's no real way of finding out um, how to uh, put a value to that. I wrote 15 because that is, uh, spoiler alert, the best value for this particular model today. Um, and you can test that yourself, put in 10, put in 20, put in 30. Um, there are ways of, of stopping your algorithm when it reaches a kind of plateau in accuracy. Um, but I don't have the time to talk about that today. There's a lot of things that I won't be able to have time to talk about today when it comes to neural networks. I could have made this entire presentation just on artificial neural networks. Um, but it's important to realize that sometimes neural networks are overkill. Sometimes they are overkill. Uh, you don't want to use them for everything. Okay, we then want to evaluate the model and that will evaluate that loss value and metric value for the model um, as we have been doing previously uh, with like predictions on the boosted decision tree. This does exactly the same thing, it's just an evaluate. Uh, and we want to visualize. So we're not gonna be using the same uh, method we're going to be using matplotlib. Uh, uh, the first thing we do is create a confusion matrix, um, which is this. So you can imagine that we've got um, mm, uh, positive, negative, positive, so positive, uh, negative, false, and so true and false. So true positive is going to be here. And true uh, negative is also going to be here. And then we've got false positives and false negatives. Um, what you really want uh, for a confusing matrix is for there to be uh, zeros on your um, uh, values here and here, and just all your data to be uh, on your, um, your diagonal. This is the number of true, this basically is the number of um, correctly classified pulsars. This is your number of, sorry, this will be the number of your correctly classified not pulsars. 
and this is the number of correctly classified pulsars. And then these will be your uh, false um, pulsars and your false not a pulsars. Okay, that's how you would read your confusion metrics matrix. If that sounds confusing, hence the name. Um, so it's probably better to use something like this. Uh, so you want to access the um, history, which is why we uh, said we have a, a history here. So this essentially creates um, kind of like a, a data frame of your history scores. And you want to access your uh, history, then history dot history, access the accuracy. And then history dot history, access the val accuracy, which is a validation accuracy. Um, and then that will create a uh, description of how accurate your model is being. So uh, this is how accurate it is on your training data and on your testing data. You're looking for the numbers to be close, right, which they are, but you're also looking for the shapes to be pretty much the same, which they, they pretty much are, right, especially towards the end. If the shapes are wildly different, um, you may have an unstable model. If the values are very far away from each other, you're probably overtraining. Um, if your training accuracy is a lot higher than your testing accuracy, definitely overtraining your model and you need to go and uh, change a few things, maybe uh, increase the number of layers, increase the number of neurons, et cetera, et cetera, or, or change something else. You can also do a history of the loss um, using pretty much the same thing, except now you're using loss and val loss as your metrics. Um, <clears throat> the rest of this stuff is um, sort of classic matplotlib um, manipulation. You don't really have to add this, but um, I did it just to sort of pedagogical reasons so I can teach better. Um, and this shows you just how much uh, your loss changes over time. Um, so our loss is pretty good. Um, it starts off quite high. I expect that, completely expect that. And then it goes right down. It starts off low for your testing because it does the testing at the end of your um, error calculation and after it's done a bit of uh, back prop. Um, so it will be usually better in terms of uh, loss. And you can see that from here as well, right? Uh, but this follows basically the same trend. So we think it's pretty good. Uh, I think I have enough time to give you 10 minutes. Can I get like a thumbs up from someone to tell me that I can give them like 10 minutes to, to work on this themselves? Um, I think that should be okay. Um, I, I will be able to answer some questions if you have, oh, I believe we do. So yeah, you can uh, work on this. I'll, I'll, I'll go back to the first slide. Okay. Let's see here. Sarah, no worries. Uh, absolutely. Um, ah, ah, oh my goodness. The, the compliments. I am loving this. Don't ask me any more questions. Give me more compliments. That's great. <laughs> Uh, totally love a second session. Oh my God, I was, I was joking, but if you're gonna keep going, that's, that's fine. <laughs> um, yeah, I'd be down to do uh, second sessions if, if anyone is interested. Um, okay, cool, 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 cool. Let's have a look. Is PyTorch different from Keras, TensorFlow, and SKLearn and used for deploying models? Ramya, yes. Um, PyTorch is Facebook's version of uh, Keras TensorFlow. Totally fine to use. Um, they have different functionalities, different ways of presenting things, different visualizations, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so some people prefer PyTorch, especially if you buy server time from Facebook. Um, the interface between PyTorch and their servers is obviously better. Um, and they actually might, I'm not sure if this is true, but people I know swear that they throttle server speed if you don't use PyTorch. I'm willing to believe that because of the kind of company Facebook is, um, but you know, that this might be tinfoil hat wearing. 
Um, I know how to add hidden layers in my code. What would be the best number of layers? What would be the best number of layers in this case? Um, I have done this with one layer because the data is simple and there's not a lot of it. If you add three layers, uh, I actually think I'm willing to bet money on this. And that, that I might live to regret that. Um, that you will get an increase between 0 0.5 and 1% by adding three layers. I don't think it will make much of a difference. Um, and it's faster to not include them. However, a, uh, the caveat here is that because we don't have that many, um, that, that much data, um, you probably won't notice a difference in speed or accuracy really. Um, but when it comes to doing things like higher level analysis, uh, you will start to notice. So for instance, when I made the, I, I made, um, God, what was it called? Google Net, which is the 2014 winner of uh, image recognition. Uh, that used something really fancy called sparse networks rather than dense networks. Um, that uses, let me try I remember, technically, Twenty two layers, and each of those layers were split into like prongs, like, th like each one would do this and then would come off into three and then join at the top and meet up and keep going. Um, that you will definitely notice speed up and speed down. Why is the accuracy so high at Epoch 1? I thought it would start random and converge. Yeah, the thing is that it's um, your analysis, so functions are still being fit um, at the input layer. So at the input layer, it uh, sees a, like a version of the uh, code. It will fit it to a specific function, so this relu function, and relu is really good basically is the answer to your question. Relu is a very good activation function. Um, the hidden layer will then have a lot of different, um, it will have different considerations, different weightings, and Relu again, very good. Sigmoid again, very good. So it, it is based on activation functions as well. Um, and the data, and the data. So, and the optimizer as well will come into play. For instance, when, when I was doing, so. This is a bit of a um, get your tiny violins out, ladies and gents. Uh, but my model that I was working on for the last for four, three months, I'm now doing the write up of it, um, started out its accuracy at 15% uh, rather than 95. <laughs> um, and then got to be, I think, uh, maximum like 60% accurate. Um, so that's a good point, actually. If your model sucks, don't be downheartened. I've made models really recently that are really like that are worse than flipping a coin. Like it's not necessarily a bad thing. Sometimes the data is not great. Sometimes the model just doesn't work. As long as you can present why it didn't work. So in my case, it was because um, I was trying something that was a bit crazy with the data anyway, and I knew it probably wouldn't work, but we wanted to have a look and see if it would. Um, so that's basically it. It depends on data and then how you do it. Uh, da, 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 da. Is there an industry standard? Um, TensorFlow, PyTorch. Yeah, those are the two big ones. Um, Keras. It, it, honestly, it's preference. Preference um, for that. Uh, I'm going to go now, but it's fun. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so statistical data analysis is something that people should definitely brush up on. Um, I haven't, I've, I've tried not to assume a lot of knowledge and tried to explain it, um, but it, it is just maths. There's actually a kind of a joke in, um, in data science. If I am explaining it, explaining what I do to people who are going to give me money to fund it, it's called artificial intelligence. If I am advertising for a job, it's called machine learning. 
if I am actually doing it, it's just called regression. <laughs> it's just statistical data analysis over and over again. Um, technically speaking, technically speaking, oh God, uh, I'm going to get crucified for this. Technically speaking, you could do machine learning with a bunch of if statements. Um, I can see the data science uh, people sending a nuke to my house now, um, but it, it is just statistical data analysis. Uh, bam, bada, bam, bada, bam. Are weights and biases assigned by algorithms and when? Yeah, yeah. So um, this is what this kernel initializer does. It assigns it immediately as you um, compile and then fit. Usually it would just assign it to begin with a normal distribution, so a Gaussian distribution, that's it's what it's known as. Um, so a Gaussian distribution, uh, just in case you've heard me say that and I'm like, what, what the hell are you talking about? Um, if you've ever seen like a, a, like a bell curve, that's kind of what a Gaussian distribution is. Uh, although a bell distribution, I think is slightly different, um, but it, it's basically what a Gaussian distribution is. Uh, yeah, so one more question. I'll answer this one from Maria then. Uh, okay, so uh, what about XGBoost? Is it popular to use, not for NNs, for decision trees around the forest? Yeah, XGBoost is super popular, uh, super popular. Um, AdaBoost isn't um, used always. It's just often used because it's the one that's uh, sort of easy to understand maybe than XGBoost, uh, but yeah. Okay, so the final uh, thing, uh, sorry. Just a quick answer to this question because it is a very good one. Um, uh, Ikram, um, look up MNIST. So let me type that in the chat. MNIST uh, data set. That is your bread and butter. That's your hello world. Uh, okay, so finally, uh, just something to think about. Um, I realize that I'm, I may be running over time, but um, this is a selection of faces. Um, I want people with, in 15 seconds, just tell me uh, uh, which section of this do you think uh, are the real faces and which are the fake ones. So uh, top right, top left, bottom right, bottom left. Um, just type it in the chat if you will. If you want to have a guess, obviously you don't have to. Okay, we've got a bottom right, but oh, okay. So people are thinking bottom right, bottom left, real, bottom right. Great. Okay, so a uh, trick question. They're all fake. They are all fake faces. They were all generated by a gener generative adversarial network. And a GAN uh, was invented in 2014. Um, and it's essentially two neural networks that play a game with each other. Uh, so one of them tries to fool the other one by creating fake data. And you then uh, keep that going until the discriminating neural network uh, is only able to get an accuracy of 50% if it's two data sets. Uh, basically, that means that it's flipping a coin every single time. Uh, now, the important thing here is that this has been able to create deep fakes. Uh, and what I want you to take away above all things from this talk is that artificial intelligence is incredibly good at what it does. Um, the uh, GANs are used for generating new data, simulated data, that sort of thing. They're very good at what they do. However, you also need to understand the ethics and morality behind using artificial intelligence. Notice, for instance, that this is incredibly good at white faces. Incredibly good at white faces. Um, that's because a lot of AI is based on training on uh, white faces, on westernized faces, uh, to a lesser extent um, uh, Chinese, East Asian, because they have a very good artificial intelligence program. Um, but it's, uh, you need to sort of think about how best to use AI and also where AI is being used. So if we return to the case of China, unfortunately, during the Hong Kong protests, um, AI was used to identify protesters, which is why they used to, they, they, they had uh, umbrellas and things like that. So whilst artificial intelligence has been used to more accurately than dermatologists find skin cancer um, and breast cancer as well, it's huge in the medical field. And it's, you know, it's incredible to be able to, 
solve a problem like breast cancer or at least solve um, diagnosis using AI. Um, it can also be used for more malicious ends. Um, so this is just something to think about um, when you're having a look at these kind of algorithms. <clears throat> so I will now release you. I apologize uh, if I've run over, um, but I did want to get that last point out. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Joe and Yin, for putting this event together. Uh, thank you all of you for joining. And as usual, we are uh, we very welcome your feedback. If you have any ideas, criticism, or if you would like to speak at one of our events, uh, please do reach out. Uh, we are going to share the recording and the slides uh, a little bit later with you. And yeah, thanks again. Have a nice evening and hope to see you soon. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you for joining us.